Welcome back to this series on neural network programming with PyTorch. To kick the series off, let's introduce PyTorch, a deep learning neural network package for Python. There's no better place to start as we'll be using PyTorch to program our neural networks. Without further ado, let's get started. PyTorch is a deep learning framework and scientific computing package. The scientific computing aspect of PyTorch is primarily a result of PyTorch's tensor library and associated tensor operations. As we will see in future videos, a tensor is an n-dimensional array, or nd array. One of the most popular scientific computing packages for Python is NumPy. NumPy is the go-to package for nd arrays. PyTorch's tensor library mirrors NumPy's n-dimensional array capabilities very closely, and in addition, is highly interoperable with NumPy itself. With PyTorch tensors, GPU support is built in. It's very easy with PyTorch to move tensors to and from a GPU if we have one installed on our system. We'll talk more about GPUs and why we use them in deep learning in the post on CUDA. For now, just know that PyTorch tensors and their associated operations are very similar to NumPy n-dimensional arrays. Before we dive any deeper into the PyTorch feature set, let's take a walk down memory lane and look at a brief history of PyTorch. A brief history here is a must because PyTorch is a relatively young framework. The initial release of PyTorch was in October of 2016. And before PyTorch was created, there was and still is another framework called Torch. Torch is a machine learning framework that's been around for quite a while and is based on the Lua programming language. The connection between PyTorch and this Lua version called Torch exists because many of the developers who maintain the Lua version are indeed the individuals who created PyTorch, notably Salmuth. My name is Salmuth. Salmuth Chintala is credited with bootstrapping the PyTorch project, and his reason for creating PyTorch is pretty simple. The Lua version of Torch was aging, and so a newer version written in Python was needed. As a result, PyTorch came to be. When PyTorch started, I was maintaining a framework called Torch. Um, it was based out of Lua, uh, which is this language that's obscure, uh, but it, like, there was a big deep learning framework uh, called Torch that, that used it. And it had a Keras-like model, um, and it worked pretty well, except that Lua as an ecosystem is really small. And also, Torch's design has existed from like 2009, 2010. And you know how, as a field, as we move uh, in terms of research, uh, the tooling has to move with you. Otherwise, like, the tooling becomes irrelevant. It's not flexible enough for what researchers want today. So Torch's design was aging. Uh, and I was like, I need a new tool. And TensorFlow came like a year before that. And we tried it, and it just wasn't cutting it for us. Like, we, we couldn't debug day-to-day uh, -day things. And, and it, was, it was like for us, like a, a very personal opinion, and it was painful to use. So uh, then we were like, OK, why don't we just build something that's Torch-based, but in Python, uh, that has a new design from all the lessons we learned from the last few years. And that's pretty much how it started. I want to talk to you now about Facebook. One thing that you may hear about PyTorch is that it was created and is now maintained by Facebook. This is because Salmuth Chintala worked at Facebook AI Research when PyTorch was created. My name is Salmuth. I work at Facebook as a research engineer. And he still does at the time of the recording of this video. However, there are many other companies with a vested interest in PyTorch. And it's built out by all these companies, not just Facebook, and also universities. We can look at the individual contributors directly on the GitHub repo. We just go to Insights and then Contributors. This shows us the contributors by number of commits. This is the best way to get an idea for who is working on a project. All right. Let's check out the deep learning specific features of PyTorch now. Programming neural networks in deep learning definitely requires the use of tensors, but if we want a rich framework, we need more than just tensors. PyTorch gives us just that. This table gives us a list of PyTorch packages and their corresponding descriptions. These are the primary PyTorch components we'll be learning about and using as we build neural networks in this series. The Torch package is the top level package that contains all other packages as well as the tensor library. 
library. The next two packages, Torch.nn and Torch.autograd, are the primary workhorse packages of PyTorch. Torch.nn, the NN here stands for Neural Network, contains classes and modules like layers, weights, and forward functions. Torch.nn is where neural networks are built, so we'll spend a lot of time working directly with Torch.nn. Torch.autograd is a subpackage that handles the derivative calculations needed to optimize our neural network weights. At their core, all deep learning frameworks have two features, a tensor library and a package for computing derivatives. And for PyTorch, these two are Torch and Torch.autograd. For the typical deep learning functions and optimization algorithms, we have torch.nn.functional and torch.optim. Torch.nn.functional is the functional interface that gives us access to functions like loss functions, activation functions, and convolution operations. And torch.optim gives us access to typical optimization algorithms like SGD and Atom. Torch.utils is a subpackage that contains utility classes like datasets and data loaders that make data preprocessing much easier. Finally, we have TorchVision, which is a separate package that provides us access to popular datasets, model architectures, and image transformations for computer vision. Throughout this series, we'll be working with all of these packages, and by the end of our first project, you'll be very familiar and comfortable with all of these. So you'll know a lot of stuff, but should you? What would become of you? Let's talk about the prospects of jumping in and learning PyTorch. For beginners to deep learning in neural networks, the top reason for learning PyTorch is that it is a thin framework that stays out of the way. When we build neural networks with PyTorch, we are super close to programming neural networks from scratch. The experience of programming in PyTorch is as close as it gets to the real thing. After understanding the process of programming neural networks with PyTorch, it's pretty easy to see how the process works from scratch, say in pure Python, for example. This is why PyTorch is great for beginners. So to answer the question, what would become of you? The answer is that you'll have a much deeper understanding of neural networks and the deep learning process after using PyTorch. One of the top philosophies of PyTorch is to stay out of the way, and this makes it so that we can focus more on neural networks and less on the actual framework. These are basically what we, we kind of uh, keep in mind. We want to stay out of the way of the user. Uh, we don't want to like overburden them with uh, uh, like abstractions or um, like complicated API procedures. Um, we want to cater to the impatient. We want things to be always be interactive, uh, quick, um, no compilation time. Uh, we want to promote a linear and interactive code flow. Um, and uh, we want to be uh, interoperating with the Python ecosystem as naturally as possible. Um, and we want to be as fast as any other package that, that uh, provides the same features that we do. These philosophies contribute greatly to PyTorch's modern, Pythonic, and thin design. When we create neural networks in PyTorch, we are just writing and extending standard Python classes. And when we debug PyTorch code, we are using the standard Python debugger. In the deep learning uh, framework space, it is not obvious that if you use some framework that just say has a Python API that you could use the Python debugger, for example, because uh, like a lot of these frameworks are provided as black boxes where you create your model, but then when you run it, it's run in some kind of C++ runtime, so you can't actually you know set Python breakpoints and see what's going on and print things and so on. You can use your favorite uh, Python debugger. You can use PyCharm. You can use uh, uh, PDB. Uh, you can use Print, for example. Um, and it's kind of uh, as smooth as debugging other parts of your Python code. So PyTorch is a good framework for learning about neural networks, mainly because of its simplicity. And this simplicity is also the characteristic that strengthens PyTorch's longevity as a framework. Another common characteristic that is often associated with PyTorch is that it is the preferred framework for research. The reason for this research suitability has to do with a technical design consideration. To optimize neural networks, we need to calculate derivatives. And to do this computationally, deep learning frameworks use what are called computational graphs. Computational graphs are used to graph the function operations that occur on tensors inside neural networks. 
These graphs are often used to compute the derivatives needed to optimize the neural network's weights. PyTorch uses a computational graph that is called a dynamic computational graph. This means that the graph is generated on the fly as the operations occur. This is in contrast to static graphs that are fully determined before the actual operations occur. It just so happens that many of the cutting edge research topics in deep learning are requiring or benefiting greatly from dynamic graphs. We are ready now to get PyTorch installed. If text-based resources are your thing, check out the text-based post for this video on deeplizzard.com. The text version may contain updates or additions too, so keep that in mind. Also, if you haven't already, check out the Deep Lizard Hive Mine for exclusive Deep Lizard perks and rewards, and consider joining. Don't forget to watch the PyTorch prerequisites and syllabus video that comes before this one in the series, and let us hear from you. What do you think of PyTorch? Leave a comment with your thoughts, and I'll see you in the next one one.